don't go yet. You got to show the world one 10 seconds. <laughs> okay, I'm counting. 10, 9. <laughs> Janie went. Oh, Why I can't I go? She leaves us a picture, though, so that's good. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Uh, and so today we're digging into uh, part three of Did Jesus Want Water Baptism? Uh, I've got a, uh, a deal, uh, from Mark F McPhail sent me a website and, uh, it was a guy that was teaching against water baptism, uh, a couple of years before I did. And so that was kind of cool to see, uh, when I, you know, did the water baptism book, I did. I scoured the internet and I couldn't find anything where somebody didn't believe in that. But this guy was on it a couple of years before me, and uh, the, his theme is wet baptism or dry baptism. And I thought that was really an interesting. I liked the way he worded that. So you'll probably hear me talk today about wet baptism versus dry baptism or wet baptism versus spiritual baptism is another way to say it. Uh, but anyway, so today let's look at some of the scriptures relating to baptism that were brought by Peter and take a deeper look into what they were really saying and see if the interpretations handed down since Rome took over really fit with the scriptures. Uh, but before I just wanted to say uh, some people have mentioned, you know, the attacks. I got kind of kicked out of that one blog because I don't believe in water baptism. And uh, they were saying that uh, that I think the apostles are wrong and that I am right, you know, which really <laughs> makes you look like a complete idiot, you know. And, and I think it's... Uh, I just wanted to address that, lest anybody think that. Uh, so I just say here, you know, for those that maybe haven't read that blog, uh, that it, I've been attacked by Bob Sackett, who is the leader of that blog. And uh, he went to a church that some of us attended. Uh, and he says that I teach that I am right and the apostles were wrong. And that now I am on Satan's side. So that's a pretty heavy thing to say to somebody. Yeah, it is. Just because I don't believe the same as he does. You know, that doesn't mean I've joined Satan's side. Uh, and in case anyone is concerned, I, I first want to say that, of course, I do not teach that the apostles were all wrong and that I am right. And no, I am also not on Satan's side as BS states. The Lord Jesus said that the church would be built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. However, Jesus also said that they did not have all truth right at the beginning, but that the Holy Spirit would lead them into all truth. So, of course, we do not want to follow the apostles when they were wrong. Judas was an apostle, and he betrayed the Lord. So can we admit that this apostle was wrong here? I think we all would agree that Judas was wrong. And so if so, you believe that you are right and an apostle was wrong. So, you know, that sounds very heretical, but really every Christian believes uh in certain ways that the apostles were wrong because that's what the Bible teaches. Judas was very wrong here. And Peter denied the Lord saying that he never knew the man. So we should be able to all admit that Peter was wrong there when he, when he did that, he, he, he admitted it and he went out and cried bitterly after he did it. Even years after the crucifixion, Peter was still refusing to even eat with Gentile believers. 
until God spoke to him and gave Peter a vision saying, do not call unclean what I have cleansed. So do we then agree with the apostle Peter that we should all reject Gentile believers and not eat with them? Not if we want to be on the wrong side of God. So uh, the fact that various of these apostles just like all of us have in our Christian walk have come into new truth as we go along. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're still not the foundation stones that the Lord built his church upon. So it's really a demonic trick to tell the world uh, that someone thinks they are right and the apostles are wrong and that I have thusly joined Satan. Bob Sackett is bearing false witness and is breaking one of the Ten Commandments by doing that. And that's not a small thing in God's eyes, purposely lying against another brother in Christ just because you disagree. And really, I don't like to get on this subject, but I just think it's important to, I think people have a right to clear their name somewhat and say, if people are saying you teach this and this, you have a right to say, no, that's really not what I believe and teach. I fully agree with the Apostle Paul, who said that Christ has not sent me to baptize. And I agree with the new truth that Paul came into, being led by the Holy Spirit, as Jesus said would happen, where Paul even thanked God that he only baptized a few of them. I fully agree with Paul there. And I agree with what Paul taught in Hebrews 9, 9 through 11, that the gifts and the sacrificial offerings of the law and their water baptisms in Greek were no longer required in the new covenant. So I think all of us agree with that, that the sacrificial offerings are no longer required. But Paul added in the, the gifts and the baptisms. They're no longer required. It's, we're not under that law in the new covenant. And so that is the real reason that Paul quit doing water baptisms and thanked God for it, because he understood that he was now in the new covenant. It is Bob Sackett that actually does not agree with the Apostle Paul here, not me. And it's Bob that is yielding to Satan here in his attacks, not me. So anyway, I just wanted to clear the air on that. So getting back to our study on wet baptism versus dry baptism, I don't know if I said this already, but oh yeah, I did say say that, that I, I got that blog Mark McPhail sent me. Uh, I'll put that in the... Uh, uh, thing down below if anybody wants to look at that other guy's blog i think he really has some good points and i like you know none of us agree on every point probably but uh but i thought he had some really good points if anybody wants to read that guy's blog i'll put it in the uh whatever it's called uh, at the bottom of the video you know presentation uh so the following is from the book, The Messiah's Baptism, Chapter 3. And I just wanted to show, before we get into what Peter says, uh, how baptisms had to be done in living water, and what, what this was, this living water, and then how Jesus dealt with the living water, what, what he pointed to. So in Jewish history, living water was associated with ritual purification referring to a body of moving water, such as a river. That's why they would call it living, uh, as compared to like a stagnant pond. You know, you mm -hmm. couldn't go out and do a baptism in a stagnant pond, uh, according to the law. <clears throat> this was often a requirement for ritual cleansings that they called baptisms, which is you know, meaning immersions, dippings, uh, ritual pu purifications in water. The Jewish encyclopedia shows that waters for baptisms and ritual washings in a mikvah 
must come from these living waters. So it wasn't just any water that uh, will work. So here's quoting the Jewish encyclopedia who are not Christians, of course. And they say the water of the mikvah must come from a natural spring or from a river that has its source in a natural spring. And then they go on and say, well, some authorities say rainwater in a tank is okay also. Uh, but the Hebrew word translated as running in some of these scriptures is actually the same word uh, that means alive or living that Jesus used when he talked about living waters that he would bring. And so uh, here in Leviticus 15, three, this uh, God is giving Moses the law and or Moses is, you know, explaining it to the people. Uh, and a man who becomes unclean because of a discharge, you know, here's how he'll get clean. He, he uh, washes his clothes and then he must bathe his body in running water. Well, running it actually, the Hebrew word is alive uh, slash living. So it's, you know, and they mean running waters by that, but. Mm -hmm. And so the two, two more scriptures on living waters from the Old Testament. Uh, as for the living bird, and all three of these are the same word living. Uh living bird, living bird, and running water is, is the same word that means living. So they just translated in English to running, but it's, it's talking about living water. And you can see here, water living. That's the two Greek words there that I highlighted. Jeremiah, God is speaking spiritually, and he says, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. So God is showing that he is what really cleanses him. He is this fountain of spiritual life, spiritual living waters that washes us and cleanses us. So that's what he was telling them. He is this fountain of living waters. And, and of course, Jesus was that also jesus was the purification that god sent so here uh when you read the new testament matthew mark luke and john you see that jesus was really not enamored with the ritual water for purification he knew that it was that he would bring in the spiritual fountain of living waters that jeremiah talked about here that God spoke through Jeremiah that would provide the true washing for all uncleanness. And here Jesus speaks of these same living waters using the same two Greek words, but in the spiritual sense. So you can see here, it's the same, same Greek words, one for water, one for living. He that believeth on me Jesus said, as the scripture say, hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So this had a real special meaning to the Jews. This was not something that uh, Jesus created in his day. Their history of living water went way back to Moses. And so they, this was very common. But Jesus is talking about these living waters flowing out from the believer. So this was a new aspect. And it was based on he that believeth on him, on Jesus. The believer shall have this happen. And then a little insert here. When Jesus turned the water into wine at the wedding in Cana, he was actually in type turning the water of ritual cleansing for their baptisms into the spiritual new wine of rejoicing, the spirit baptism that God called him to bring in. So let's look at that real quick. And 
so they're at this wedding and Jesus is there and his mother and not sure who all else, but, uh, and when the wine gave out, so they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, <laughs> she's being a mom and kind of giving him a subtle hint. They have <laughs> no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what, what have I to do with you? My hour has not yet come. And so then his mother says to the servants, she seems to have a certain intuition here that Jesus is going to do something. And so she just goes to the servants and says, whatever he says to you, do it. <laughs> and so verse six, and there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. So these water pots were for the ritual purification, for the baptisms. The Greek word for uh, purifying of the Jews is katharismos. You know, we use that in hospitals, or I mean, you know, something is cathartic, or it's, you know, providing a cleansing kind of thing. But anyway, the Greek word means a cleansing, purification, a ritual purgation or washing, uh, the washing of the Jews before and after their meals. So Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them to the brim. And, and he said to them, you know, now draw some out and take it to the head waiter. And they took it to him. And when the hen head waiter tasted the water which had become wine and did not know where it came from but the servants who had drawn the water knew so you can tell there's kind of like a little bit of a uh you know i don't know what the term would be but you're you're not supposed to have wine in these ritual purification uh stone containers and so there, they didn't just make a big point. Hey, we use these uh, ritual purification uh, containers, and Jesus mm -hmm. turned it into wine. So they kept that part to themselves. They just brought him the uh, wine. And so the head waiter says, every man serves the good wine first. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. The, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, every man serves the good wine first, and when men have freely drunk, then that which is, you know, then they bring in the wine that's not so good, because, you know, their senses aren't as acute, you know, they're not going to notice that the wine's not so good after they've already had some. But you have kept the good wine until now. So anyway, just kind of interesting that, uh, you know, you could at least say that Jesus was not going out of his way to show respect unto the uh, ritual washings there. Uh, when he turned the water into wine in those containers. So just like we saw when he entered the Pharisees home for dinner, he was not, we covered this last week, but he was not following all of their ritual purifications. And so Luke 11, 38, and when the Pharisee, when Jesus came into dinner and the Pharisee marveled that he had not first washed before dinner. Well, the Greek word there is he had not first baptized. So Young's literal says he did not first baptize himself before the dinner. And you can see the Greek word baptism there, baptized. Now, so Jesus was baptized by John while living under Old Covenant law, but he also obeyed the Passover laws and he kept the laws of the Passover sacrifice uh, and other law. I meant to say the Sabbath here. I'm sorry I wrote that. So Jesus you know, there were a few times when he told the one young man to, or the one man that got healed to carry his bed. Uh, but there he was going by the spirit of the law. 
I don't think Jesus just went out and worked on the farm on Saturday. I think, you know, on the Sabbath, I think he obeyed all those laws. He came to fulfill them, but not in the legalistic sense that the Pharisees might have wanted. Uh, but as God's heart was, that's how he fulfilled them. But John's water baptism was an Old Testament directive brought in by God. So that was different than some of the other baptisms that they did. And so Jesus, being a man under God's commands, submitted to John's water baptism, but he did not submit to their other water baptisms, as we see in the verse above. Jesus knew that he would bring in the true cleansing. So Revelation 1.5 and from Jesus Christ, who is faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead and prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So that's how we're cleansed, because of his sacrifice. And then Zechariah 13.1, In that day there shall be a fountain opened to the house of David, and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And so Jesus was that fountain. And he is that fountain. And this is speaking in this, the context of this verse is to natural Israel, Israel who will accept Christ at the second coming, and this fountain will be opened. But to anyone in our day, who opens up, Jesus will be that fountain today. So it's not only for that day, but it's for anyone, including in Jesus' day. Jesus knew that he would be this spiritual fountain. So back to Jesus and the living waters. Uh, and this is with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. Jesus answered and said unto her, if thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him and he would have given thee living water. And, and please, if anyone has a question or anything or a point, you know, feel free to jump in. The woman saith unto him, sir, thou hast nothing to draw. And the well is deep from whence hast thou that living water. So she's, you know, trying to find out, what do you mean by this living water you're going to give? Jesus didn't have any way to get uh, natural water out of that well, so he can't be talking about that. And then, so Jesus says, uh, well, this is a couple of verses <coughs> later. In verse 14, Jesus says, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never first. So he's talking about the spiritual water uh, when he says drinketh. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up to everlasting life. So that's the living water that he gives. It's that it's uh, similar to that other verse we saw where it comes streaming out of the believer to give uh, cleansing to others. And to the believer, of course. <clears throat> and to those who the believer brings into that cleansing, those who come to Christ, you know, you, you become that, you know, rivers of living water to all who believe. It, so is that a baptism in water that Jesus is promising here? Or is it a ritual immersion in water that he states will spring up to everlasting life? I think we would say that, no, he's talking about his spiritual baptism, his spiritual waters. So now to the baptism scriptures that Peter brings. Uh, and, you know, we've seen over the last few weeks how Rome persecuted and rejected the Messianic believers uh, who were not believing in water baptism and Rome's uh, other rituals, and how Rome came up with certain doctrines which were not of God. 
But would God allow the Roman controlled church to miss the truth of the Messiah's spirit baptism? According to Jesus, God not only would, but he does do such things. Here is what Jesus said concerning the religious leaders in his day. So Luke 10, 21. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. So Jesus rejoiced in spirit that God hid certain things from those who are wise and prudent and see themselves as Pharisaic religious leaders over the people. Uh, God does not allow, he does not reveal certain truth to them. And it seems good in his sight to do that. There are doctrines in the Bible that require a believer to accurately divide the word of God. And so that's why we're told to do that. Second Timothy 2.15, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so this proves that there are scriptures that can be misunderstood if they are not rightly divided. So we always want to try to divide the truth from that which is not true. And then keep a good spirit as we do that. Uh, so with that in mind today, we will consider some of the tougher scriptures that most people have uh, been certain refer to water baptism. Uh, but which most of them refer to the spirit baptism that Jesus was to bring in. So we'll go into John's main baptism scriptures. Uh, this first one is Acts chapter eleven fifteen, where the Gentiles got filled with the Holy Spirit. So this was a real shocker to Peter and the Jews. Uh, and so I'll just, Peter is recounting to these other Jews who were kind of chewing him out and said, what are you doing with these Gentiles? You know, so Peter's explaining you know, and as I began to speak to them, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as he did upon us at the beginning. Remember the 120 Jews on the day of Pentecost? Mm -hmm. And verse 16, and I remembered the word of the Lord, how he used to say, John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If God, therefore, gave them, the Gentiles, the same gift as he gave to us after believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? So that's a pretty amazing thing, Peter says. It's almost like he wanted to stand in, in the way because this seems so wrong. But Peter is telling these other Jews, who was I to stand in God's way? This is God that was doing this. And verse 18, and when they heard this, they quieted down and glorified God, saying, well, then, God has granted to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. They didn't say the water baptism that leads to life. They said the repentance that leads to life. <clears throat> so they really deserve a lot of credit here because all their lives, you know, they had seen these Gentiles as unclean and uh, God had said, stay separate, you know, from the unclean nations. And and uh, now they could see that, hey, if God is accepting these people, we better quiet down and, and realize that God has granted uh, to the Gentiles the same repentance. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a neat set of scriptures there. So the next verse of Peter that people use a lot is Acts 2.38. And in Acts 2.38, the baptism that Peter speaks of is for the forgiveness of sins. So we need to think about what is the baptism that forgives our sins? Is it a water one? 
or is it when we believe in the Lord Jesus and receive his baptism, his washing that comes from believing? The spiritual baptism or the wet baptism? I kind of like spiritual baptism better than dry baptism. But I thought that was good that that one guy was contrasting him that way. So is water baptism necessary for salvation? Because that's what Peter seems to be saying. We will look into a new understanding of Acts 2.38 shortly, but allow me to lay some groundwork first. So here's Acts 2.38, and Peter said to them, Repent, and let each of you be baptized. And I inserted washed here just because we've already seen how certain uh, scriptures were translated into English. The word baptism was translated as washed, like where the Pharisees washed their hands to the wrist, or where Jesus didn't baptize before dinner, that was that hand washing that they were supposed to do, which they called a baptism. But, and we saw the uh, uh, Strong's definition that washed was one meaning of baptized. So Peter could be saying here, be washed in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall be, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, the key I highlighted here is whatever is Peter is saying, it's for the forgiveness of your sins. And so, you know, that's a pretty big thing. If, if the water is for the if getting wet and having a man say the right phrase is how we are forgiven, you know, that's a pretty important thing. But if it's the Messiah's, you know, the baptism that Jesus was to bring in, John brought in water, but Jesus with the Holy Spirit, many of the scriptures said. Then we want to consider that maybe that's the baptism Peter's talking about here. Uh, so before we consider a new understanding on what Peter's really saying, it's important to ask one question. And that is, based on the many scriptures that say we are saved by believing in Jesus, and we covered several of those in the first two uh, studies, if a person has believed in Christ and received him into their heart, being forgiven and born again, or born from above, as the Greek says, by the Spirit of God, and thus are washed and cleansed by the blood of Christ, do they still need a baptism tank with water and a man to say a correct formula or phrase over them, such as I now baptize you in Jesus name to obtain salvation? So in a sense, you could say, are God and Jesus enough for salvation or do we need a religious man to speak a phrase during a wet water baptism? We are given a clear answer to this in Acts 10. And I can say for me, I don't know if some of you were filled with the Holy Spirit and born again before you were baptized, but I know I was. I was born again and asked Jesus to come into my heart and I knew I was changed. And then someone at the chapel uh, was telling me, well, now you can get the Holy Spirit. And I, I was like, well, what's that? You know, how do I do that? <laughs> And uh, so two weeks later, I went in and, and asked that they pray that I get that. And I got that and began, you know, was able to speak in tongues and have the prayer language. And then a couple of weeks later, they said, you know, the guy that I was kind of hanging out with that brought me to church, you know, said, well, now you need to get a water baptism. You know, I'm thinking, hey, I, I'm, aren't I saved yet? You know, what more do I have to do here? You know. But anyway, I thought, okay, if it's what the Lord wants, let's go, you know. And uh, But anyway, the point is, is 
some of us were saved and filled with the Holy Spirit before getting a water immersion. And so that proves that it's not the water immersion that cleanses us from sin, uh, but it's when we believe in Jesus. That's when our bodies are then ready and cleansed to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. But anyway, we have a clear answer in Acts 10 where God filled the unbaptized, uncircumcised Gentiles with his Holy Spirit, those Gentiles who were believing Peter's message on salvation through Christ. And we know that God does not fill unsaved people with his Holy Spirit. Is there anybody else, you know, that would say they were uh, born again or spirit filled before receiving a water baptism? I don't know if anybody else had that. Which time? Don's way or the other way? Uh, well, <laughs> either way, I guess. I had to be baptized again in Don's way, so I was already spirit filled, I guess. Oh, but you weren't baptized with the correct phrase right yeah okay okay but well, i did get, go in the living water out on that show island in the middle of the winter yeah <laughs> that's oh. is that living <laughs> water oops were you saying something Jeannie? oh no i just i just went ooh because she was in yeah. the in the winter in the water on bashan that's cold water Ooh, that's scary yeah yeah <laughs> so anyway in acts 10 here uh it was not water baptism that brought forgiveness because these unbaptized gentiles were filled by god with his holy spirit without them having had a water baptism rite. Instead, it was the spiritual washing, the spiritual baptism that comes from believing in Jesus for the forgiveness, just as Peter told them in Acts 10, 43. So that's what Peter told them, that it would be by believing in Christ. So Acts 10, 43, of him, speaking of Jesus, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. So Peter is not preaching a great importance of water baptism to these Gentiles. And they would be the ones who had never had a water baptism. He's saying that water, the forgiveness of sin comes from everyone who believes in him. But coming back to Acts 2.38, the first thing to see is that Peter does not say water baptized there. So we would need to decide, is he going backwards to John's baptism in water, the one that Jesus and John the Baptist kept contrasting Jesus's baptism with? Is, he, is Peter going back to John's baptism in water, but using a new name, the name of Jesus? And, and really, there's no proof that John uh, said, I now baptize you in the name of John, you know, when he did his baptisms. That's really a Roman Catholic idea that you're supposed to have this phrase with a name. That's not how the Jews used that term, and it's not how they did their baptisms. Uh, so we, we don't want to overlay Roman Catholic or Protestant teaching onto what Peter would have believed at this time. Uh, and this was only, uh, you know, like I say, 10 days after Jesus had ascended up. And, but, or is John referring to the spirit baptism that the Lord Jesus was prophesied to bring in? So it's kind of a tricky verse. And, you know, I'm not 100% dogmatic, but the more I look into this and the more I look into these verses, I think 
several of them are really talking more about the spirit washing, the spirit baptism, uh, than going back to a water one. So remember, the Lord reminded them about 10 days before this event that they, before Acts, uh, before Pentecost, where they got filled with the Holy Spirit, that they would be baptized in the Holy Spirit, not in water, in just a few days. So Jesus isn't saying, hey, Peter, I've got a new water baptism. Make sure you bring this to all the Jews. It'll be a great new water baptism, but it'll be in my name. So that'll really be a good one. Uh, Jesus never said that anywhere. So it's really unbiblical to teach that or think that. Uh, Jesus never said anyone to be water baptized. But anyway, so here's Acts 1.5. For John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So that would have been in Peter's mind, you know. Uh, he would have at least, especially after they're all spirit filled on that day, uh, you know, it's hard to say all that Jesus taught him when he walked among them after the resurrection, but you can sure see here he's telling them you're going to be baptized, not with John's, but with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus is stressing the importance of his baptism. That's the Holy Spirit baptism that he would bring over the water baptism of John, which was brought in at God's direction. But God himself also never said anything about a new water baptism that will come when his son comes. In fact, God says his son would baptize with the spirit baptism. Secondly, since in our subject verse, Peter says that his baptism is for the forgiveness of your sins. I'm sorry, that this baptism that Peter was saying they needed to do, uh, oh, well, he didn't say, he just said be baptized or be washed in the name of Jesus. So he, he didn't say go out and get a baptism. He just said be washed or be baptized. We would have to decide how that should be interpreted and whether it would reply to the wet washing or to the spirit washing. But anyway, uh, it would make far more sense that, that this is talking about the baptism that Jesus was to bring in, the spiritual baptism, the spiritual washing, the spiritual cleansing that comes from believing in Christ and appropriating. As we saw Peter said, of him, all the prophets, everyone who believes and receives in him, receives forgiveness of sin. So I can say that's what happened to me when I believed and asked Jesus, you know, for forgiveness and cleansing. I woke up and I was a different person. I knew I was mm -hmm. cleansed because I looked different in the mirror even. <laughs> And I think all of us would say, you know, when we were born again, we could tell something was different. You know, you had a, you know, except those who have been brought up with the teaching, you know, that can be different because you were always kind of washed and cleansed. So notice how this, that scripture here fits with Acts 2.38 that says through his name, everyone who repents receives forgiveness of sins. Uh, so Peter said to them, repent and let each of you be washed in the name of Jesus for you, the forgiveness of your sins. So is that why we had to do a Don's way? Well, I mean, it wasn't Don's way. That's well, kind yeah. of, it's kind but of a, uh, protestant teaching you know that uh, the roman catholics baptized in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit but the protestants right. the, 
Protestants saw that all the apostles went out and they would say, be baptized in the name of Jesus. And so that's what the Protestant churches teach is that it's in the name of Jesus and that the other one would then not be valid. Yeah, I was just trying to refresh my memory as to why I had to be baptized all over again. Yeah, well, that's why is because, you know, I remember that people would say, are, well, are you saying I'm not saved because I got baptized at the Lutheran church? Yeah, and, it was, yeah. and then it was kind of like, well, brother, I'd be careful. I would just do it the right way that the <laughs> Lord, you know, you're kind of hung out to dry a little like, oh, boy, you know, it's kind of, you know, it would have been kind of scary to not do it, you know. Yeah, exactly. So we have had 1800 years of where baptism means a specific religious rite. So every time we see that in the Bible, our mind automatically goes to that specific religious rite where a man immerses you in water and then cites a phrase over you. Uh, but we've already seen how that was different to the Jews and in the New Testament. So when God, Jesus, John the Baptist, and Peter, and then there's the verses, all said that John baptized with water, but Jesus would baptize not with water, but with the Holy Spirit. We need to understand how the Jews of his day used that word baptized. So according to Strong's definition above, Peter could have just as easily been meaning the following, and I already said this, so I won't, but repent and let each of you be washed, cleansed, immersed spiritually in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, just like Peter and the 120 did that day. It wasn't just for Peter and the 120, he realized it was for the rest, for the other Jews. Now, some of you may ask, well, we already covered that. Uh, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. We did cover this last week, but some people say, well, why would the Peter tell these spirit-filled believers to then get water baptized. He told the Jews to go, you know, uh, and so in Acts 10, 48 or somewhere in there, Peter says, you know, can we forbid the water that these might be baptized or something like that? Uh, anyway, it must be understood that water baptism was a Jewish phenomenon long before it became a Catholic Protestant rite. And in the first century Israel, and even today, uh, any Gentile that wanted to be a proselyte and thus be accepted within the Jewish community had to have a water baptism so as to be ceremonially washed of any false gods or impurities of their heathen past. You know, the Jews didn't want to be around unclean people. And so because, you know, that had been their history for 1400 years since Moses to avoid unclean and don't touch any dead lizard or you're unclean or a dead body. You know, they were very uh, focused on this. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the Jewish encyclopedia under their baptism heading gives us the history going back to Jesus time and before the baptism of a proselyte. That's a Gentile who, wants to join the Jewish community, has for its purpose his cleansing from the impurity of idolatry and the re restoration to the purity of a newborn man. This may be learned from the Talmud. And they go into different things. He must bathe or immerse or baptize in, excuse me, in the name of God, Lashem Shemayim, that is, and then they explain it, what that means, what it means to be baptized in the name of God. You know, the Jews, did they say, I now baptize you in the name of God? No, they didn't have a phrase. There's no proof anywhere that says that's how they did things. But 
here the Jewish Encyclopedia explains what that Talmudic, those words in the Talmud mean, and they say that is, assume the yoke of God's kingdom imposed upon him by the one who leads him into baptism, or else he is not admitted to Ju Judaism. So same thing when you say baptize in the name of Jesus, it's meaning assume the yoke uh, by of what Jesus puts out. You're you're joining yourself to that. You're, you know, and we'll see later. You know that it says uh, whatsoever you do, do in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus. And that doesn't mean that everything we do. You know, I now take another bite of steak uh, in Jesus' name. I now have a sip of grape juice. In G I now turn the TV off in Jesus' name. You know, it doesn't mean that in their idiom. But anyway, I just thought I'd cover that because people say, oh, look, uh, Peter told them to get baptized. But yeah, that's just because he didn't want these Gentiles unwashed and to still be considered unclean. He wanted them accepted into the Jewish community, like among all those Jews he was talking to in Acts 11, for them to be able to come into the house and be one with them, they had to have the Jewish immersions. Clearly, these Gentiles were saved by believing, and because they believed what Peter was saying. And this was all done before any water baptism rite. So when Peter says, surely we cannot forbid water, the Greek actually there says the water. And it's referring to a certain water. It's the water of immersion, which was required for a Gentile in Jerusalem to be accepted among the Jews. And remember, even Paul had so-and-so uncircumcised, become circumcised so that he could go in among the Jews and teach. So they weren't adverse to doing a couple things that allowed them to be able to stay within the Jewish community and minister. Paul said to the Jew, I became a Jew. You know, he did that in certain ways, but he also taught that we don't need circumcision. It's the, it's the circumcision without hands. And it's same thing with the baptism. We don't need those ritual immersions anymore. <laughs> Paul, being the more scholarly apostle, came to realize that Christ did not send him to baptize, even thanking God that he only water baptized a few of them. Paul understood that the water baptisms were not a part of the new covenant. So we already saw that, that they were regulations for the body, uh, Hebrews 9, 10, and 11, uh, where the Greek word translated as washings is, again, baptisms. So now, uh, you know, having looked at all that background, uh, Here's a new uh, look at something in Acts 2.38 that I wish I would have seen before writing the Messiah's Baptism book because I would have included it. But uh, many translations like the NAS below say baptized in Jesus' name for Acts 2.38. Uh, but notice that Young's literal translation further below says on Jesus' name, which seems kind of strange. How do you bap how are you baptized on the name of Jesus? That seems kind of weird. To the remission of sins. But before we get to the Greek, uh, remember what Peter said to those Gentiles. Well, we already saw this, I'm sorry. Uh, but yeah. It's everyone who believes in his name receives forgiveness. Peter was telling them how to be forgiven of God and nothing about water baptism. There was no water involved. Uh, 
Okay, so considering what this on means in this verse, in Acts 2.38, baptized, why did Young's literal say on Jesus' name? How do you baptize someone on Jesus' name? Uh, in Greek language, if epi is the word for on or upon normally, uh, but if you said Joe sat epi the front porch, and if epi was in the genitive case, it would mean Joe sat on the front porch. But if the Greek word epi is in the dative case, which is just another Greek, it's how they did things. They would use different cases to bring out the meaning. So if, if you use the word epi in the following sentence and said that Joe sat on the front pit porch of the courthouse because he was protesting his father's false conviction that came epi, a false testimony. So would you say that came on a false testimony or came by a false, you know, you could in English, you wouldn't say mm -hmm. it came upon a false testimony wouldn't seem to fit. But, but anyway, if, if you were meaning it in that sense, not that you're sitting on the front porch, but you're, it's a cause, causal, C-A-U-S-E, uh, then you would translate epi in the dative case, meaning on the basis of false testimony. So hopefully that's not too confusing there, but the epi in Acts 2.38 is in the dative case and should therefore be translated as be baptized, i.e. washed, immersed, cleansed, spiritually, probably, be baptized on the basis of the name Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Daniel Wallace, in his excellent Greek grammar beyond the basics, explains this definition for the Greek epi when it's in the dative case. He calls it a dative of cause and says that's how you would translate it as on the basis of. So that young man that was sitting on the courthouse was protesting his father's false conviction on the basis of, that happened on the basis of a false testimony. Well, here with Jesus, be baptized on the basis of the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. It's showing cause. So epi, basic uses with genitive, dative, and accusative. With genitive, it's this. With dative, you have a, B, three different ways it can go. It can be on, upon, against, at the time of, during. So it's not be baptized during the name of Jesus. And then, uh, or with the, I'm sorry, and the third one down is cause. It's what cause is this on? or on, it's on the basis of. So, so that would be saying in Acts 2.38, uh, instead of be baptized on his name, it would be uh, be baptized on the basis of the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And hi and welcome to Bonnie and Steve. Hi. Good to hi. see you. So we just got home, so we're a little bit late. So Okay. Glad you could make it anyway. Yeah. But yeah, you'll, you know, I'll send you the video. So if you want to catch the first part, because you'll okay. kind of, kind of, uh, it's all built on what went earlier kind of thing. But, uh -huh. but yeah, so that's what we're just talking about is Acts 238 and what Peter meant there. Does our salvation come by an immersion in water or does it come by believing in Jesus? You know, it's kind of what we're getting uh -huh. down to. Okay. So, so we, we covered this already, I know, but remember the Roman Catholic meaning of baptism was different than what the Jewish understanding was. So the, the Greek word 
uh, in the New Testament means to cleanse by dipping, to wash, to wash oneself. So there's different ways you can translate baptism. And, and so in that Acts 2.38, it could easily say, uh, be washed on the basis of the name Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And, you know, just because nobody has ever considered that, that is what the Greek says. And so that's definitely one option as we're rightly dividing the truth. Uh, so to wash oneself, the Messiah's baptism was a spiritual washing, a cleansing that comes from believing in Christ. Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So Paul says nothing to the Romans there about water baptism, but he says, uh, you know, confess and believe and you will be saved. And the UBS Greek English Dictionary of the New Testament confirms the same meaning for the Greek word in the dative case that we saw there uh, for be baptized in or on the name Jesus. The Greek meaning is on the basis of. So here, epi, you can see they give the same meaning, on the basis of, when in the dative. And here below, in yellow, is an example of epi in the scriptures that is also in the date of case, and it's being translated the correct way. You can see the, in the English, they translated it on the basis of. So the same epi in the date of case could be translated the exact same way in Acts 2.38, be washed on the basis of faith in his name. He's telling the Jews this. And here you can see the Greek word epi in the date of case. That's what they would do in the Greek. They would have, you know, just like we do in English, we say he, you know, if you see the word run, you know, Joe will run. Well, we would add the word will. If you say Joe ran, we spell run differently. If if it's currently running, well, then we add an ing to the word. Well, Greek does the same things to show past, present, you know, all those things. Uh, so a person can be healed on the basis of Jesus' name, like up here, on the basis of faith in his name, this guy was healed. Uh, but can a person be washed and cleansed from sin by believing on the basis of Jesus' name and all that that encompasses? Yes, forgiven and washed on the basis of Jesus' name. So as we said before, Jesus never told a single person to be water baptized. We have two verses uh, that are both contested scriptures you know, by scholars contest whether Matthew 28, 19, uh, you know, there's different variations in the manuscripts. But either way, he doesn't say go out and water baptize them. He just says go out and baptize them. So would that mean bap baptize, wash, immerse in a scrub it up in the tub water baptism? or in the spiritual baptism that he was to bring in. Ugh. So, he said, he said for them to go out, preach the, preach the gospel and baptize, and they, and they believe it. But they hear the, the, um, the good news and that's how they receive the Holy Spirit. Right. <clears throat> Amen. You know, I was going to tell you earlier, 
But yeah. I didn't know I didn't know my microphone was off. I don't know how that happened. I was talking and I'm like, <laughs> I was like, why are you not listening to me? And I looked down, I thought, oh man, how'd that happen? Yeah. So um last night, it's about three hours and seventeen minutes, the movies about the apostles and the book of Acts. None of them, they, I mean, book, chapter, and verse, they would watch the words, and they never, I never see them baptize anybody with the water. None. And and I'm like, wow, man, I never seen that movie. That's a good movie. You know, they, they did exactly like what you're saying right now. And and I'm like, man. And and they say uh, that, if you, that if you believe that God raised Jesus. Oh no 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 no! That you believe that uh, yeah, God has raised him from the dead. It's in the book of Acts too, and right. you shall be saved and all that stuff. Just like in Roman um ten nine, right? So I was looking at it for a long time, and I said, man, that's the good stuff. I never yeah. seen it before. Hey, I didn't had nobody in the water. Yep. So. And if Paul water baptized a few people before coming into the New Testament truth, that really doesn't mean anything. Uh, you can't hold some, you know, point to someone and say, oh, look, you did that. Well, yeah, I did that, but I came into new truth. So that's what's important is that Paul and the others were led by the Holy Spirit to come into New Testament truth. And, and then they taught it, and that's how we know it's true, because we see them teaching it. And finally, we see in Revelation 5 that John, the apostle, is weeping greatly because no one was worthy to open the scroll and redeem the righteous. But one of the elders tells John, stop weeping. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah has overcome. And then the Lord Jesus was pictured as this lamb as if standing, as if slain. And those in heaven sing a new song, Revelation 5, 9, and they sang a, and they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, not by a minister doing a water baptism, but Jesus redeemed us to God by his blood out of every kindred. So every nationality, every race, tongue, people, and nation. And so, again, this does not say we're redeemed by a baptismal tank and a Protestant minister uh, with, who uses the correct formula. So it shows that Christ was slain for us and that in his shedding of blood, the price is paid for all who believe. No extra deeds or add-ons were needed. So when we add the first century Jewish understanding of the word baptism and how the New Testament believed Jesus used it spiritually, along with the date of of epi, understanding that Greek word in the dative, we could more properly translate Peter in Acts 2.38 as followed. And Peter said to them, repent and let each of you be washed or cleansed or immersed or baptized spiritually. Again, yeah, that's me reading in spiritually because we don't know, but I'm just saying he could be meaning this in a spiritual sense. Be washed on the basis of the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Uh, because it can't mean be water baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, because that would be false doctrine. And we, we uh, you know, I don't think that would uh, would happen. I don't think God would allow uh this actual teaching that water baptism without you know qualification so uh 
The only one, the only one that about touching water in the book of bad is the eunuch. Yeah, and there's some question on the others. So uh, again, on all of them, we have to rightly divide, and we can't force our view on anybody else. It's just uh, because if it doesn't say water, you can't force it to be water, but you also can't force it to be a spirit baptism. You know, we have to try to rightly divide the context. And so that's what we're trying to do. Uh, but anyway, this that I just read there would be the accurate translation of what Peter was meaning. Uh, and there are too many scriptures that are contrary to the teaching that says the deed of water baptism with the correct formula spoken is what brings forgiveness of sins. So, you know, there's just too many verses in the Bible that contradict that type of a teaching. This is non-biblical that you have to go out and do a deed with a Protestant or Catholic minister of water immersion and that God and Jesus are not enough to save you. The blood of Jesus is not enough. You need this other add-on. That's not biblical. So I ask here, will anyone say that after a believer accepts the sacrifice of Christ, believing in Jesus shed blood for sacrifice of sins, and then is filled and washed with the Holy Spirit of God, that they are still not saved? Will they, they still haven't been forgiven? Will they say that after all that, they still need a man to attain salvation, a pastor, a priest, and to say the correct baptismal phrase as that man immerses them in water? And only then can they be saved. You know, I think that's very wrong doctrine for people to say that. And as we saw earlier, Bob Sackett is essentially saying, I have joined with Satan because I believe what Paul says here about water baptism. But anyway, that's a side talk. Uh, so that teaching basically says that Christ and God working together cannot bring salvation, but a man performing a deed is still needed, a baptismal rite in water for salvation. So if everybody's not worn out, uh, I can go into uh, uh, Second Peter. Or I'm sorry, First Peter, three twenty one, uh, and this is the final verse where Peter says something that kind of looks or could be interpreted as water baptism until you look at it a little closer. Uh, but we got a half hour left, so. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into this. Uh, so Peter and the washing that saves us. So we want to think, what is the washing that saves us? The water immersion or the spirit immersion that Jesus was to bring? The living waters. <clears throat> and that's, Bonnie, what you wouldn't have heard at the beginning, I went into a thing on living waters that uh, <laughs> go into the Old Testament and show how all the sacrifices and different things and the cleansings had to be done in living water. And that that's what Jesus was talking about when he said the believer would have living waters flowing mm -hmm. out from him. Uh, so anyway, uh, as for explaining whether the Lord wants water baptism or his own spirit baptism, the most difficult verse is 1 Peter 3.21, where Peter really seems to say that water baptism is what saves you. Yet we will soon see that harmonizing this verse with the main body of evidence of all the other scriptures ends up being fairly easy. So here is that portion of scripture from NAS, 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21. 
uh, talking about those who in Noah's day, uh, they were sometimes disobedient, the Bible says, uh, but who were once disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. And corresponding to that, or uh, a two type of that, baptism now, now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh. So that's an important part of this. Peter is saying it's not uh, a scrub-a-dub outward removal of dirt from the flesh that a water baptism could be interpreted as, but it's an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Christ. So first thing you notice here, again, is that Peter does not say it's a water baptism that saves you. So here where he says, baptism now saves you. And then he tells you which one. The appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the baptism that now saves you. Not the dirty removal of what, you know, going in the water uh, that can only remove dirt from the flesh. It's a bodily uh, immersion. So, uh, so we would then need to determine, since Peter doesn't say which baptism, uh, did he intend the washing in water that Paul says is no longer imposed in the new covenant, that immersion, or whether he meant the spirit baptism saves us, that Jesus provides. And this was many years after the resurrection, so Peter would have had some 20 years or more of time, you know, with the other apostles, and he met up with Paul once or twice. Uh, you know, he would have known how to get saved. Let's just put it that way. And whether it was the water baptisms that saved us or whether believing in Christ was sufficient. So he would have known this by the time Peter wrote 1 Peter 3. Uh, but anyway, here's uh, where Paul, we saw this earlier, but... Hebrews 9.9, 9, he's, Paul's been talking about the uh, Old Testament and the various sacrifices and things. And he says, this is an illustration for the present time, indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. So again, it's talking about what will clear the conscience. Peter talks about this immersion is going to clear the conscience. Well, do him and Paul disagree here? Or is Peter talking about the same clearing the conscience that comes when we accept Christ? But Paul says those Old Testament sacrifices were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper, but were only in matters of food and drink and various ritual washings, which were regulations concerning the flesh, imposed until the time of the new order. So this is these uh, regulations, these uh, various sacrifices and offerings and ritual washings were imposed, but only until the time of the new order. Now that we're in the new covenant, these things are no longer imposed. We don't have to go out and do the sacrifices. We don't have to do the various, and the Greek word here is baptisms. We don't have to do the various ritual water baptisms that they had to do in the old covenant. They were only imposed until the time of the new order. So again, the English says various ritual washings, but the Greek says the various baptisms 
in the original Greek that Paul spoke. That's why Paul stopped doing the water baptisms is he quickly came to understand that they're not required in the new covenant. <laughs> we are washed, immersed, cleansed by Christ and don't need a water ritual. So we also know that Paul thanked God that he water baptized only a few people and emphatically stated that Christ did not send him to baptize. This, of course, is very bizarre for Paul to say if water baptism is actually what saved us. And so Paul would thus be saying to the Corinthians, I thank God I only got a couple of you saved by water baptism because Christ did not send me to save anyone. You know, that wouldn't make sense. So. Because that way nobody can say they were saved by Paul. What's that, John? That way nobody can say that, that they were saved, they were baptized by Paul. And his name, I mean, in Paul's name. Yeah, it's it's just... Paul didn't want to do water baptisms. He didn't want that connected with his name. He did a couple and then he understood that he's now he's in the new covenant. He doesn't need to go do these ritual immersions. And so he thanked God that he only did a couple of them and he didn't want that connected with his name. We already covered that last week. I don't know if you remember, but. Yeah, uh, and, and, and you know what got good with that verse? Uh, yeah. In, in at, I mean, yeah, in Act um, 4, in verse 12, that I used to use that a lot, I shared with you one time. Yeah. I think that go good with that. But, um, yeah, I'll read that. It says, uh, and there is salvation in, uh, in no one else. So talking about Christ. For there is no other name under heaven which has been given among men by which we must be saved. So it's by his name. You know, we're washed in his name. So that's what they're talking about. Uh, so here's some reasons why Peter does not mean that baptism in water is what saves us. So before we say what Peter is saying, let's first show what he is not intending when he says what he said about. Some say that Peter is picturing Noah being saved by a water baptism and that this corresponds to the Catholic Protestant water baptism that saves us. That idea breaks down when we consider the facts. For instance, those saved under Noah were never water baptized. The only ones that got immersed in water were those who drowned in the flood. So that's not what Peter is saying, is that just like Noah was water baptized, we get water baptized. <clears throat> uh, and Jesus was talking about the same thing when he spoke of uh, Noah and the ark was air, you know, they were aerated into cell, you know, they were saved and stayed above the waters. Uh, so that doesn't make sense that Peter would be saying that because those in the ark were dry. They were not water immersed. And as I said earlier, the rules for proper Bible interpretation says that we do not allow one slightly cryptic verse to overturn well-established Bible truth. So with that in mind, please consider the following facts that prove Peter does not mean baptism in water is what saves us. So number one, if baptism in water is what really saves us, couldn't the Messiah, the savior of the world, have told us just once to specifically water baptize so we would know how to be saved? He told many times to believe in him to be saved, but not once did he ever say, 
receive the glorious water baptism and only then can you be saved. And so for him to be the savior, you would think he would at least tell us one time how to get saved if water baptism was the way. And in all of the Messiah's teaching, not once does he ever tell anyone to be baptized in water. Not only that, but he tells the unbaptized thief on the cross that he will soon be with him in paradise instead of explaining to him that without a proper water baptism, he cannot be saved. Also, why is it that Jesus in Acts 1.5, John 1.33, all these verses all point forward to the Messiah's spirit baptism? If it is really the one in water that saves us. Why not be like Rome and just drop the spirit baptism and continue with their water baptism? Because we went many, many hundreds of years where people weren't being spirit filled until uh, the early Pentecostal revivals in the 1900s, where people started saying, hey, we're all getting water baptized, but what about becoming spirit baptized? But in all these scriptures, every time they clearly contrast the two baptisms, saying that John baptized in water, but the Messiah will baptize in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the scripture states specifically that it was God who sent John to baptize in water. But not a single scripture exists where God sends the Messiah to baptize in water. Peter, Peter said that many times in the book of Acts. Says what? He said that all the time in, in the book of Acts. He said John baptized with water. You know, he, he's not saying to be baptized with the water, but, he, you know, what you just said. Right, Peter yeah. said that many times in the book of Acts. But let yeah. me tell you something. I know that I'm just not thinking about this. I think all the apostles before uh besides Paul, I think they understood not to baptize anybody with water. And because they didn't baptize nobody in the water besides Philip, but Philip, he didn't want to hurt his feelings. He said, Well, you know, you don't need to be baptized in the water. I don't think he wants to tell him that. So that's the only one, that's the only one baptized with the water. But Peter. I think he understood not to do it with the water. Because yeah. he kept saying that many times that John baptized with water, and, and, and but, but with Jesus, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He said that many times. Yeah, Acts 11, 16. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, and again, they were coming into New Covenant Truth. And that's what Jesus said. The Holy Spirit would lead them into all truth. And so we see that happening. Uh, and so why on earth does Paul boast that he, I mean, you could say it's, you know, it, it almost looks like he's boasting that he thanks God that he only baptized a few people. Uh, if baptism in water is what saves us, how could Paul say such a thing? It just doesn't fit. And as we saw above, uh, why then does Paul say the washings, baptisms from the Old Covenant are carnal ordinances that no, are no longer imposed? They're regulations for the flesh, uh, but that were not imposed on New Covenant believers. And why does Paul say that there is one baptism? And then he goes on in 1 Corinthians uh, 6 11 and 12 13 uh, that it was the spirit baptism that by one spirit they first corinthians 12 13 by one spirit they were all baptized into one body if there are clearly two baptisms the water baptism that supposedly saves us and the messiah's spirit baptism that apparently is not effective for salvation if, if those were the two baptisms, why would Paul say there is one? And then again, why would Paul say 
It's by one spirit that we were all baptized into one body. That's the one baptism that is still in effect. Rome, we saw in the part one of this series, taught that their water baptism was the one baptism. And so they completely dropped the spirit baptism. And again, if water baptism saves us, then that would have God pouring out his Holy Spirit on unsaved people in Acts 10. That's a big point there. Uh, you know, God would not fill unsaved people with his Holy Spirit. Only believers. Only people walking in the covenant. And then another reason, Paul said that the Messiah, Jesus saves us not, not because of any deeds which we have done. Titus 3, 5. Let me read that real quick. So, Paul says to Titus, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the water, I'm sorry, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. So it's by the washing that is by the Holy Spirit, a washing of regeneration and renewing. And, and so it's not a water washing that saves us. It's not by going out and doing a deed with a religious figure. Paul also taught that we are saved by believing the truth and by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, not by water washing. So 2 Thessalonians 2.13 but we ought always to thank God for you, brothers loved by the Lord. And that's who we all are, by the way, brothers and sisters loved by the Lord. That's a pretty, pretty beautiful thing there. Because from the beginning, God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the spirit and through belief in the truth. So again, Paul doesn't say, through a water immersion is how this all happens. And if Peter is really saying that baptism in water brings salvation, couldn't he have at least stated the correct formula to be spoken at this water rite? Because look at all the consternation that's caused in the churches today they're all arguing over, is it in Jesus' name? Is it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? Some, uh, some join it together and say, in the name of Jesus. They add all of them in there try it so they can't miss. You know, and so, uh, but it's really, you know, if there's a water baptism phrase that we're supposed to speak, it's really not clear. So that leaves salvation up in the air. How many will be saved because they didn't have the right phrase spoken over them by the man? <clears throat> and then verse 10, and if water baptism say us, saves us, then why does the Lord Jesus specifically tell Ananias to go pray and get Paul filled with the Holy Spirit? But he says nothing about being sure to water baptize Paul to get him saved. So in Acts 9, 17, uh, I think, let me check the verse because I had one typo in, in the book. Uh, I'm glad you bring that up. Paul received the Holy Spirit in Act 9, and he didn't get in the water. And then later in Act 19, Paul laid hand to those believers, they received the Holy Spirit. 
why later in First Corinthians one, I mean, why later did Paul baptize with water if he if he didn't do that in the first place? Uh, yeah, there's we covered that last week too, but yeah, that's uh, a question because Paul says. I only baptized, you know, uh, Chloe and whoever it was uh, and the house of Stephanus. And he says, besides that, I know not that I baptized any. And when Paul writes that to the Corinthians, that comes after Acts 19, where he bapt where it says those 12 people got baptized in the name of Jesus. I can't remember how it words it there exactly. Uh, hmm. But yeah, we covered that last week, how, uh, you know, okay. Paul said, uh, yeah, and when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So again, that could be, we've seen the word baptized in Greek is translated washed, and it can also mean immersed or cleansed. When they heard this, they were cleansed or washed in the name of the Lord Jesus by believing. And that, that's verse 5 of Acts 19. And then verse 6, and when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. So, again, you'd have, you know, since it doesn't say they were water baptized, you have to let the context decide. Uh, but one thing is certain is this happened before Paul wrote the Corinthians, and so Paul should have told them, oh, by the way, I baptized those 12 guys in water also in Acts 19, but he doesn't bring that up. So to me, that is evidence that Paul didn't water baptize anybody here. They heard this, and they were washed in the name of the Lord Jesus by believing. You can see they believed. Paul said that they should believe on that John baptized with water for repentance, saying that the people should believe on Christ. And when they heard this, they were washed in the name of the Lord Jesus. So that's definitely one way you could take that. Just like others can't force water baptism, we can't force a spiritual baptism there. But it does, to me, lean in that direction. So, yeah, thanks for making that point, John. Mm -hmm. So the simple answer for 1 Peter 3.21, uh, because it does not specifically say water baptism saves us, you know, we would need to determine which it is. And so considering all the facts that we've looked at, uh, A lot of them use that verse. Right. They say the water not save you. They use that verse. But the question is. What verse are you talking uh, about, John? The one, uh, first Peter, first Peter uh, 3 and verse yeah. 21. Right. A lot of people use that verse when they say that water, the water not stay because we need to be baptized in the water. And the question is, what the water do? They say the water wash away your sin. You sure about that? Right. But if, that's not what it's saying, Revelation 1 5. It said the blood washes away your sin, not the water. Right. Yep. So the first important thing in verse 21 is that the Greek word translated as corresponding to is actually anti type uh, or anti tupos in the Greek. We see in the scriptures that there are types and anti types that correspond to each other. For instance, we often hear that the Passover lamb was a type of Christ because it pointed forward to him. We also see that many types and antitypes in the natural to the spiritual chapter, where, you know, something in the Old Testament points forward to something in the New. Perhaps the following sentence better expresses what Peter intends here. 
the natural example of Noah coming safely through the flood corresponds to or antitypos the spiritual baptism that the Messiah provides and now saves us. So I think that's what Peter is really saying. It's the example of Noah coming safely, believing God and being part of God's plan and thus coming safely through the flood. Well, that corresponds to the baptism that now saves us, the spiritual baptism that the Messiah provides. In using the proper rules for Greek's gram Greek grammar, let's consider this scripture from the NAS below, but with a few words added by me in brackets and in italics to help demonstrate what Peter is expressing. So, <clears throat> well, I'll read 320 first, uh, just to give the context real quick. Which sometimes were disobedient, remember these ones uh, with Noah and the ark, uh, some of them were kind of, you know, they were somewhat in the covenant, but they weren't going along with Noah. So it says they were sometimes disobedient, I believe is what that's saying. When the Once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is eight saves were, eight souls were saved by water. I'm pretty sure the uh, Greek word is through there. Uh, let me look. Yeah, save dia, so through the water. They weren't drowned in the water, they went through the water. Uh, and then the next verse we see here on screen, 1 Peter 3.21, and corresponding to that, in other words, that that he just said in the last verse, those that got saved, uh, they weren't like those who disobeyed and were partly disobedient, but Noah and his family built the ark and were part of what God was doing in the last days. They rightly divided the scriptures. They put together the spiritual ark that corresponded to Noah's ark. So corresponding to that ark that Noah and them built, baptism now saves you. Not the water baptism, and I'm adding this I added, but I'm just saying I believe this is what he's really meaning. Not the water baptism that is merely the removal of dirt from the flesh, but the Messiah's spirit baptism that is an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Peter is saying, you know, corresponding or the a type of Noah coming safely is the same type of us receiving the Messiah's baptism not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but that that is an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So note that translators often add certain words, usually in italics, to give proper nuance when going from Greek to English. And that pr practice is perfectly fine as long as it helps clarify what the writer meant. That is why I added these words. So uh, in his excellent work, R Greek Beyond the Basics, Greek Grammar, Daniel Wallace shows that translating this Greek as written above is within the sphere of intended meaning. Now, he, he isn't saying, you know, directly, but by what he teaches about the Greek, it shows that this would be an accurate way. He does not give his statement below as an argument against water baptism, because I'm sure he believes in that, like almost all Protestants do. But he simply explains the Greek construction of this verse. And he says, the semantic force of this sentence is, and baptism now saves you. I'm not talking about the kind which removes dirt from the body, 
So that comes from uh, Greek grammar beyond the basics. That kind of baptism that removes dirt from the body is, of course, a water baptism and only a water baptism. But Peter specifically states here, this is not the baptism that will save you and bring you a good conscience. Peter is saying in verse 21 that it's the Messiah's spiritual baptism, the spiritual washing that saves us by our believing in and appropriating the atonement that he provided for us through his death and resurrection. So just about done, just a couple more scriptures. Uh, so we saw Hebrews 9, 9, and 10, where Paul says, you know, that the animal sacrifices and water baptisms could not make the worshipers perfect in conscience. A few verses later in, for, in Hebrews, Paul states that the only thing that can truly cleanse our conscience is this. And he says, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, how much more will that blood of Christ cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So Paul is not showing that it's a water immersion that cleanses your conscience, but the same blood of Christ that saves you and cleanses you, us. So when Peter speaks of the baptism in verse 21 above, that is a, an appeal to God for a good conscience, he therefore has to be referring to the Messiah's spirit baptism. Otherwise, he disagrees with Paul, who says that those Old Testament things don't give you that cleansing of the conscience, as Hebrews 9, 10, and 11, and 14 all say. Mm -hmm. Also, since neither God nor Jesus ever said to specifically water baptize anyone in the new covenant, it makes much more sense that the Messiah's spirit baptism that saves us, not any of the water baptisms. And so if we, like Paul, uh, don't believe in water baptism, uh, Pharisees might say we follow Satan, but that doesn't mean <laughs> they're right in that. It might be them that are uh, being the child of the devil, like Jesus rebuked the Pharisees in his day. And, and really, that's church history. It's always those who move into new truth are rejected and attacked. And so uh, the Lord doesn't want us to throw away truth, but to hold the truth. So, well, it's 601. Uh, Mine say 801. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, John, you're really <laughs> you're really spiritual. You had two extra hours. <laughs> oh gosh. At least he's got it straight these days. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, so I think you know that's that's got uh you that's know the only thing we needed. All we needed. Is to hear the gospel if you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead and that blood washed away your sin and you're already safe. Right. Amen, John. That's why he said he made a better covenant. Yeah. Make it more easy for us. Very good point. Well, Lord bless each one of you. Thank you for the study. Uh, thank you, Jeannie. I really appreciate it. Thank all of you for being a part of it. And uh, may the Lord bless each one. Does anybody have anything else to add? Feel free to 
say, but otherwise, uh, this is the last one in yeah. first John, in first John 1 mm -hmm. in verse 6 and 7. Um, what is that? Something about the fellowship. Uh oh, did I hit stop? I, I might have hit, didn't I? I think I forgot to hit recording. Oh man. Oh, no. no, I think you did hit it. Good. It's, it's I think I reminded yeah. you in the beginning. You did. Because I, I had to hit the got it button. So I think you did record it. Yeah, he did. I okay. had to hit mine too. Oh, okay. Well, usually this stop recording is lit up, but for some reason it's not lit up. Mm. Uh, last time when I did this, I, I dropped everybody. So go ahead and finish real quick, John, and then I'll hit stop recording. I was saying in First John 1 and verse 6 and 7, something about the fellowship, the blood or something. Yeah, yeah. I can't, I can't remember what the word was. Yeah, but... it says, uh, as we fellowship with one another, the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin, something along that line. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, <laughs> we need to start having water baptisms every time we get together. Yeah. Because uh, that's the only way this can happen. Yeah, I'm going to get the cup of water and pour it pour in your head and <laughs> baptize you like that. Yeah, well, it's got to be an immersion. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'll give you stop. Can you stop recording now, Al? Yeah, hold on. Let me hit stop. Yeah.